we have decided today to do a review on a particular book the great pyramid proof of god by george r riffett we have skipped purposefully all the information about architectural design structure how did they cut the stones how did they get it up there they're so heavy 80,000 tons or something like that blocks where we feel that it's common knowledge is available on social media like YouTube videos where people have asked archaeologists etc wow how did they lift those 80,000 ton stones and put them in place how are they so precise etc etc in favour of chapter 3 God's Bible in stone the religious aspect our investigation follows a different angle of sight viewed casually from the outside the Great Pyramid is nothing more than a very ancient architectural wonder it is a question whether it would ever have had any other significance but for the light thrown upon it from two widely separated and differentiated sources the Bible and the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Had the pyramid not been forcefully opened in AD 820 for the fabulous treasure reported to be within its hidden chambers, entrance would most certainly have been affected since because of the information contained in the ancient pagan literature. By reason of this and the results of subsequent scientific research, the pyramid now is known to have not only architectural greatness but profound religious value. Archaeologists, scholars and distinguished men of science have all rendered invaluable service in the patient accumulation of the facts which sustain the judgment that the Great Pyramid is indeed God's Bible in stone. If man is what the Bible alleges him to be, it follows that he needs a revelation or revelation from God, one pertaining to such matters as are of absolute and abiding worth to him in his lost or fallen state. Without such revelation or revelation, and minus mental ability to discern facts beyond death or in the realm of the supernatural, he is doomed while living to religious agnosticism and an existence far more unsatisfactory than that of the lower creatures or insects. Adlib. Then two, such revelation or revelation should be put in simple language and understandable with average intelligence. It ought never to be deceptive in any sense for any poetic, traditional or other reasons. It should convey truth that is unchangeable and universal in its value to man and have an uplifting, refining effect whenever it is, it is accepted. Such a revelation or revelation we believe that Bible to be. It meets all the tests, provides all the need and truth, is not deceptive and conducts all who believe and practice it to the finest type of life known. It's only deceptive because man has tampered it through as many translations of the copies of copies of copies of copies of a copy, not the original manuscript, added to it, taken away from it, revised it, then revised it again, then revised it again, and basically corrupted it throughout the centuries to your modern versions, translations that you have today. And God, if God is, and it is illogical to deny him existence, and is what the Bible alleges him to be, then he most certainly desires man to have the revelation so imperatively needed. And further, such a revelation should not only stand the test of honest, sensible reasoning, but also provide an opportunity for a faith that transcends reason in the same sense that the spirit of man transcends mere mentality. A factual faith is theoretically correct, Actually, it is often a hindrance to progress, a snare to doubt and defeat. It tends to close the door of achievement in a new field or on a higher level. Only the timid and inexperienced spend their time splashing in the shallow waters along the shore. Real swimming is possible to those who only, to those only who venture out where the waters are deep and the bottom beyond reach. So the finest, most heroic attainments of the soul are not those based upon reason, nor yet upon conclusive evidence, but upon a faith unsupported except by intuition of right. A revelation of God should therefore anticipate strong, heroic affirmation where concrete evidence is impossible. The only reason for such faith must be, sometimes be the simple statement of the Bible. 
And it is from just such an elevation as this that man begins his life in the kingdom of God and spiritual reality. Stone witness that the Bible is God's revelation of truth to man is an established fact. Nor is the divine author opposed to any reasonable test which might be made of such statements. Submit the historical records of 5,000 years. Go. Do they contradict this revelation? No. In every instance they confirm. Summon the archaeologists. They dig in the ruins, tombs and archives of all the world. Have they found anything? Yes. But all their findings, and they are legion, they are numerous, are favourable, never otherwise. But science... Does not the Bible fall before its attacks and discoveries? Why should it? The divine author has met science in its own chosen field and in terms, values and methods which it alone can understand has made a demonstration which indicates that not only the authorship and truth of the Bible but of the Great Pyramid as well. Anticipating the attacks of speculative science and the needs of honest-minded men in a sceptical age such as ours, God 4,500 years ago is now known to have outwitted his and the Bible's critics and enemies by enshrining in solid stone the same marvellous messianic and prophetic revelation contained in the Holy Scriptures. The Great Pyramid is, therefore, God's original record of the biblical revelation presented in the symbols and terms of modern science and preserved in imperishable, unchangeable granite. It's a monument of God's presence his people there and so forth the dual basis for truth if our last statement is correct then we should be able to show that the message of the pyramid is exactly the message of the bible not that all the information of the one is recorded in the other but that there are no contradictions and that in all the facts and teachings common to both there is perfect agreement in the bible the basis for truth is history for the pyramid it is science in the Bible, the medium of revelation is language. For the pyramid, symbols, and mathematics. For the Bible, a period of 1,600 years was necessary to present a revelation spanning 6,000 years of history. For the pyramid, only 30 years were needed. In the Bible, some prophecies are indefinite as to their date of fulfillment, but very specific as to their significance. While in the pyramid, the events are fixed to the exact day, but the meaning unknown until after occurrence. Statements of fact, not theory. Before submitting evidence to show the oneness of the pyramid and the Bible messages, it should be repeated that we are not dealing with theories, not with concrete facts. The pyramid under discussion is not a theory, but a solid stone fact, 4,500 years old and weighing over 5 million tons. Its scientific features are not figments of the imagination, not matters of theory, but of fact. They have been established as such by the surveys and calculations of the ablest of engineers and astronomers. Its chronological indications of many of the crucial events of history are not theory but fact. There are theories as to who built the pyramid and when and how, but as to its science, purpose, message and chronology, facts are our evidence and they are conclusive. The Pyramid in the Bible Scholars have believed for many years that certain statements in the Bible referred to a structure in the land of Egypt having divine significance. This they now know to be true of the Great Pyramid of Giza. Some of these statements are Isaiah 19, 19, In that day shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. And it shall be for a sign and for a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. For they shall cry unto the Lord because of the oppressors. He's talking about the Israelites. And he shall send them a saviour, a liberator, Moses, and a great one. And he shall deliver them. Moses again. He liberated them from oppression and slavery. Jeremiah 32, 18-20. The great, the mighty God, the Lord of hosts is his name. Which has set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt even unto this day, and in Israel, and among other men, and has made it a name as at this day. Job 38, 4-6 Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if you have understanding, who has laid the measure thereof? If you know it, if you know. 
or who has stretched the line upon it whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened who laid the cornerstone speaking about the Egyptian pyramid Psalms 68 21-23 I will praise thee for thou hast heard me and uh, have become my salvation the stone which the builders refused is becoming the headstone of the corner this is the Lord's doing it is marvellous in our eyes Acts 4 11-12 this is the stone which was set at Nought of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Let's talk about Jesus the Christ. 1 Peter 2 4, 7, 4 to 7. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God, and precious unto you therefore which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. So it's Christ being compared to the Egyptian pyramid the book of the dead the verses cited above all refer to a pyramidal shaped structure for the reason that it is the only type which permits a stone to be the head of the corner our attention now centres on one of the many pagan sources of information for the pyramid, the Egyptian book of the dead or what's the other name for it coming forth of the day that's supposedly the real name of it having put it in Evidence, a description of it will be appreciated. The brief account given by Basil Stewart in his admirable book, The Witness of the Great Pyramid, follows. The Book of the Dead is the title usually given to a large collection of prayers and mystical formulae, or funerary, t- funerary texts, which the ancient Egyptian scribes composed for the benefit of the departed, and by means of which the soul was enabled to secure its final rest and happiness in the next world. They were cut or painted on tombs and on the walls of burial chambers and pyramids and painted on sarcophagi and rolls of papyri. The title Book of the Dead is unsatisfactory and misleading because it is not strictly speaking a book at all but a collection of texts. This title was given to it because of the practice of burying copies of or parts of the copy with the mummy, thus giving the idea that the holy departed were regarded as dead whereas the whole conception of the doctrine of the ancient Egyptians concerning death was that it signifies, signified the entrance of the departed into life and light. The title, in fact, first conferred in the early part of the 19th century was merely a translation of the name given by the Egyptian tomb robbers to every roll of inscribed papyrus which they found alongside mummies. They knew nothing of the contents of such a roll and all they intended by the title was to say it was a dead man's book which had been found in his coffin with him. The Egyptians, moreover, possessed many funeral, funerary works which might equally be, well be called the books of the dead, but none bore a name which could be so translated, while the title which this particular collection claims for itself should be known. The Book of the Master of the Hidden Places, a title the appropriateness of which is apparent in the literature which reveals in writing the allegory, allegory of the secret is contained in the great pyramids, hidden chambers, and passages. To the above, we ought to also add to the testimony of the late Sir Gaston Maspero, Director General of Antiquities in Egypt, that the pyramid and the Book of the Dead reproduce the same original, the one in words and the other in stone. The pagan texts of great value. The significance of Sir Gaston's statement lies in the fact that the ancient texts give all the principal dimensions, exterior and interior of the pyramid and to find the unit of measure and state specifically that the year circle of 36,524.24 inches is the basis for the pyramid's geometrical system. They also define the religious meaning of the chambers and passages by the use of suggestive names, as for example, chart number one, the Grand Gallery is called the Hall of Truth and Light. Its entrance is known as the Passion of the Messiah or Crossing the Pure Waters of Life. Below the gallery, the passage is called the Hall of Truth and Darkness. The antiquity of these writings called the Book of the Dead goes back to at least 3000 BC and the profound value lies in the fact that because of their records the divine revelation enshrined in a great pyramid 45 centuries old and standing in a pagan land receives from the ancient pagan literature of that land a religious and scientific interpretation of such character that both the pyramid and the Bible are demonstrated to be of God. The downward tree. 
the Bible as a divine revelation has everything in its favour. One thing, it speaks the truth about man and his world, the condition of man and the world. In this, there is proof of its superhuman authorship. Some may protest that the Bible verdict on man, but the fact is, all of human history sustains the verdict. Its declarations are humiliating, but honest, condemning, but compassionate. The Bible denounces man for sin, but does not leave him in despair. It says plainly and persistently that he is lost and helpless and doomed to go downward and ever downward to eternal destruction, unless he admits his condition and accepts God's remedy for sin and offer of eternal life. Briefly stated, man began his career with the best endowments and in an environment practically perfect. He sinned, however, under satanic influence, which he might have resisted, and thus started humanity on its sad, tragic journey to the grave and hell, from which there is no escape except through divine intervention. This, in simple language, is the message of the Bible. Is it the message also of the Great Pyramid? The Pyramid Confirmation. If you all study chart number one, it will become apparent that's what the Bible declares in plain language. The Pyramid presents in symbolism. The descending passage, therefore, is a graphical representation of man's gravitation to lower moral and spiritual levels and finally into hell unless he is rescued by divine power. Three things are true of this passage. It leads downward to the pit or chamber of chaos. This is also known in the Book of the Dead as the chamber of upside downness, upside downness or torment. Here in a rough inverted cave-like place, the range lost souls like madmen rage in battle among themselves, beating out each other's brains with axes. This is in the interpretation given by the pagan texts. But is it not also a graphic picture of the battle carnage and hell of sin, the biblical end of a godless life, where a miracle is needed? Two passages lead up from the descending passage. One was driven, the other built. The one driven upward from near the pit is without any symbolic value because it was originally not intended to go beyond the grotto. The ascending passage is of value for it leads to the grand gallery and onto the king's chamber. But it is tightly sealed at the lower end, closing off all entrances from the descending passage. Why? Since no human power can remove the plug which closes the upward passage, entrance is possible, impossible. Oh. What's that say? Since... No human power can remove the plug which closes the upward passage. Entrance is possible. Therefore, only by miracle. Supernatural power is needed. There is a way out of sin and escape from death and hell. Spiritual eternal life is possible, but never by human effort, progress, merit or ingenuity, or these little sacrifices, these traditions that you do, you know, these rituals, uh, tassels on your clothing, all that sort of stuff. A miracle is necessary. A supernatural transaction must take place. The Bible calls it the new birth, being born of the Spirit. What could any man do to enter through the portals to physical life? Nothing. Submission to the mysterious powers of natural life is the only way. What can lost souls do to attain eternal life or be born anew of the Spirit of God? Nothing, except submit themselves in faith to him who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me or through him. Downward under Draconis. He goes on about astronomy. Draconis means dragon or devil. Does this not very significant arrangement of certain star groups in relation to the descending passage and the pit proclaim in an astonishing way the Bible's message? Exactly. Therefore, let it be said again that man, because of sin and under the influence of Draconian or Satan, and in spite of the divine influences, the Pleiades has gone down to ruin, chaos and death. The upward passage. But recovery from spiritual ruin is provided. Does not the ascending passage indicate this? It is very remarkable that of all the pyramids in Egypt, and two of them are almost as large as Cheops, only inferior. Not one has an ascending passage to chambers up in the pyramid proper. All but the great sage to chambers up in the pyramid. All but the great pyramid were built as tombs for the repose of their departed monarchs and symbolising the fact that when they died they went down to reign no more no ascending passages were built to elevated chambers which represented a nobler future kingship for the Lord and Messiah of the Great Pyramid the situation was all very different 
when he died, it was to rise again and possess the scepter of eternal, universal sovereignty. His pyramid, therefore, has an ascending passage leading to a royal chamber, splendidly elevated and rich in symbolism. The upper level. Its significance, moreover, is not confined to the great king, the risen Messiah, but includes all who, by accepting him as their sovereign and trusting him as their redeemer, have become his people. For them, too, there is an ascending passage. Men can be rescued from sin's ruins and from the jeopardy of hell. They may become men of the ascending upper level, upper life type. This, however, begins with a miracle. Not evolution, not culture, not education, but a sovereign miracle of infinite grace, or infinite grace. Any other method of salvation is as foreign to the symbolic message of the Great Pyramid as English would be to a caveman. Well, has this great structure been called God's miracle in stone? It symbolizes throughout that miraculous intervention of Jehovah in the affairs of, of individual man and civilization, which in the fullness of time will usher in the golden age, God's utopia. Prophecies fulfilled. The Bible can win its own case with divine authorship on fulfilled prophecies alone. Knowing this, skeptics have denied the antiquity of the utterance. Such procedure with the Great Pyramid would, however, be futile for its hoary age of at least 4,000 years, as admitted by all. Then, too, its system of chronology is absolutely scientific and above question. Since this matter is dealt with fully in a later chapter, a very brief illustration of how the prophetic datings may be found will suffice. The Book of the Dead fixes the exact point in the Asini passage which symbolises the death of Christ. History tells us it occurred April 7 AD 30. We are also told by the Book of the Dead that one inch in the passageways is equal to a solar year. To find then the dating of any point within the pyramid's prophetic range is merely a matter of accurate measurements and mathematics. Worked into the very design therefore of this prophetic pillar are the great crisis events of history for a period of 6,000 years. Its prophetic symbolism is usually indef indefinite as to the character of events. But after they have occurred, the prophetic deities are found to be unerring exact. As for example, the symbolism of the low passage which begins about 5 feet beyond the Great Step does not indicate World War I. It does suggest tribulation. But after the war was over, we were astounded to learn that the chronology of the low passage symbolism did fix with absolute accuracy the beginning and ending dates of that war of World War I. Pyramid, pyramid Messianism. Okay, so that last passage here relates, we find it relates to the original, ancient, very old, once hidden, therefore preserved. Galilean Aramaic New Testament manuscripts of Revelation where John has a vision John the Revelator on Patmos Isle in prison there for his belief in the Christ has that vision where he actually sees these uh, this angel in heaven who cried out after he poured this particular vessel or jug or urn whatever he had uh, onto the world he saw this prophetic vision and it said here it comes something disastrous was going to happen to the earth a great event on earth and then he says he saw talents these are Greek coins they're very heavy gold coins right? this is symbolic for bombs and then he goes on to say in, those, in the translation Galilean Aramaic into the nearest English equivalent by a native born Aramaic speaking translator Victor Alexander from Syria uh, from Mesopotamia Syria that there was a great earthquake never like never felt before on the earth ever and then the people because of this these talents falling on the head and these earthquakes and these cities being destroyed etc they ran because it's something new to them right it's probably talking about World War Two, to be more precise, because the bombs were more advanced. They dropped them from the bomb bay doors. Okay, these massive bombs, uh, like fifty or sixty or more at a time. Imagine twenty or thirty planes flying over, 
dropping all these bombs, right? Would have caused a hell of a shudder to the earth, right? It got the people scared because it's a new type of mass destruction, right? So they went and they hid in caves. You know, so, hey, hey, you know, the wrath of God is upon us. Maybe they were cursing God as well. But that's basically World War II indicated in these, this book of Revelations, Galilean Aramaic Revelations. But prior to that, in another chapter, the Euphrates dried up, a portion of it dried up, and men from the land of the rising of the sun, there's a difference in the word near, we didn't say rising sun, which would be some Asian country like China or Japan, uh, Japan, right? We all know that's the land of the rising sun. But this is saying these men came from the land of the rising of the sun from the east. Okay, crossed it, went into Europe, Berlin, as it says in the footnotes, the city of desolation, and started up all these things like prostitution, homosexuality, you know, in bars and nightclubs, all that sort of stuff. Uh, pornography, uh, bestiality, high interest loans, uh, charging their own people where they weren't supposed to according to their holy writ, their text, right? Uh, and then saying, like, payback, right, is so much. And the inflation rate was soaring, right? And these people had to pay back, like, 88%, according to Rabbi Reuben. It matches with what he says, right, on his video on YouTube. So it made it impossible to buy bread. You go to buy bread, you got a uh, cup full of Reichsmarks, right? German money. And they say, well, sorry, you haven't got enough to buy bread. So you go back, get some more, and they say, no, nah, sorry, the inflation went up again, you haven't got enough. Those sort of problems, right? So what did Hitler do? He says, well, you know, enough of this. Okay, we have to get rid of this, we have to clean it up, and apparently it took him six years. Okay, that's a statement by that Rabbi Reuven on his video, A Warning. So it matches the translator's translation of the Galilean, Galilean Aramaic New Testament Revelations, Book of Revelations, with that. Pyramid Messianism. The central Persian person of the Bible is the Messiah. The same is true of the Egyptian Book of the Dead and the Great Pyramid. In the pagan text, he is called the Lord of the Pyramid. Messianism, or the divinely given message of the coming Christ. His death, resurrection, and supremacy began with Adam when God said that the seed of the woman, or the descendants, should bruise the serpent's head. It's a devil, right? And it's demons. How would it found how it found its way into the heathen religion is therefore plain. We would indeed be greatly disappointed not to find it very prominent in the Great Pyramid. How could it be said to enshrine a divine revelation or be the pillar of altar spoken of by Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, or be a sign and a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt that the Messiah were not the central theme of the whole structure? That Its wonderful symbolism does grant him that honour is evident for a number of reasons. The threshold to the grand gallery is designated the Passion of the Messiah. The coffer, being of the same inner size as the Ark of the Covenant, which was a type of Christ, is likewise typical of him, and is the apex stone rejected by the builders of the pyramid, not a messianic symbol? Is it not a mess messianic symbol? Or pointed to the Messiah? The title cleared. In closing our chapter, or this chapter, the fact seems obvious that as the Messiah is indeed the very soul and spirit of the Bible, the master theme of both Testaments and of all the Institutes, so is he the great subject of all the chief parts of the great pyramids, interior, the burden of its noblest passages and the glory of its highest chamber. We may affirm then, upon the best of evidence, that the character of the pyramid religious symbolism as established by the Egyptian Book of the Dead and attested by the Holy Scriptures entitles this ancient pillar to be the right of being truthfully called God's Bible in stone so looking at that we realise this possibility this might upset the Pan-Africans the Kemets the, uh, 
maybe it might make the Hebrew Israelites jump like jump for joy, and everybody else may get upset. Okay. The Judaic, the rabbis, Toby Singer, etc., where it clearly points out, according to this book, uh, this writer, George Riffitt, using only established, well known, acclaimed experts to back up or for backup of what he's saying, right? He's got the evidence that proof etc done by the research of these particular people where he clearly states this highly qualified or this known archaeologist expert etc states this okay he's not mucking around and going oh well you know uh, there was a church father way back he's not doing that right? he's going to these experts okay to, pr- to bring the evidence that the Great Pyramid is proof of God, is proof of the Christ existing. Okay, the proof that He actually exists to those naysayers out there say, no, 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 it's not a fairy tale. He didn't exist. Okay, so it really blows the lid off. Well, well, we believe it. It's blowing the lid off the Kemet followers. We say, oh, it's all plagiarized. Christianity plagiarized it all, but in the true sense. The Greeks plagiarized the Hellenistic Jews texts, uh, making it in the sense that they made it very Greeky in their own, very Greek flavor, and try to make it their own, their original, right? According to historical facts. And yes, they did also plagiarize many of the icons, etc., from the Egyptian religion, Osiris, Horus. Serapis, etc., and created a brotherhood or a cult known as the Brotherhood of Serapis. And Ptolemy, one or two, sat on the throne and declared he was a king. This is where Alexander he tried to do that, apparently by sword. The Egyptian oracles said, "No, no, no! You, you're not in this in these records. You're not there." So he puts a sword to their throat, apparently, and says, Now, look again, am I there? Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, sorry, we missed that, but there you are, right there. Yeah, Alexander the Great, yeah. But he, unfortunately, he died of that fever before he could actually seat himself upon the throne. So his lieutenant general of his army, Ptolemy I, nicknamed Sotir, which means, or Sotir, which means saviour of mankind, set, push him put himself upon that throne and declared himself the new pharaoh, the new king and then had the statue made in honour of him a Greek looking with a beard man looked like Jim Morrison in his bearded days with his pot with his jug above his head that Serapis Christus, that was a symbol of it of that brotherhood, that cult which was talked about in so either 134 AD or no actually we believe it's 34 AD after Christ had died by a letter that came from Hadrian's friend Servanius that said this cult was still up and running in that era the cult of Serapis Christus or the brotherhood of Serapis Christus 